I guess. Dr. Phillips. Um, we have one of the... I'm really excited about this, guys. So uh, whoever's been following our podcast and whoever's uh, been following the... Uh, what I, what, I, what I like to call the underground F1 media, as in the, the Reddits and, and, and Twitters of the world. Um, you've, you, you might have stumbled upon one of his articles before. Uh, he is the author of the F1 Metrics uh, blog. Lots of interesting information there. Lots of cool stuff. Uh, way back, we, we talked about, uh, about this blog a, a few times before uh, when it comes to like the, uh, the piece on the econ like economics of F1. And most recently, the preseason uh, for, uh, uh, form, form guide. guide. Yeah. Uh, lots of good information here. And we could not be more pleased, more honored, more grateful to have Dr. Andrew Phillips right here, live on our show. Hello. Hi, guys. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Welcome. Welcome. So, Dr. Phillips, can we call you Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew will be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, uh, as you, well, we, we did a quick introduction here off, uh, off camera, but uh, this is Javier, Danny, and Mike from uh, the Flat of Fever podcast. Really welcome to our show, um, and uh, let's get right to it. So, the Australian Grand Prix was last weekend. Uh, it was a, it, it it was fun. Well, yeah, not, it was not exciting. The weekend before, I yeah. guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was fun. It was exciting. It was everything that. We were hoping it would be, despite the disaster of qualifying. I guess, first of all, what like, what, what what do you think about qualifying? I, I was laughing to myself, but it was a fuss. <laughs> it, it was agreed. Agreed. Yeah, and but at least round three. It, it, but but it, this is something that I that, that that I think that has been happening for quite a while, where we the fans like are put through a lot of hardship only to be redeemed on Sunday. You know what I mean? Like, it's a, I think that if 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 the, if the Grand Prix hadn't gone the way that it did, I think we'd have like a lot of a lot more people tuning out of F one. Right, a lot more pitchforks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But there yeah, was it was it wasn't like a great race. Yeah, good fun though. I mean, good good race. There was a crash. There was there, there was a red flag. There was everything that, that that we could have wanted. Any any particular. Thing that you that, that you saw that jumped out at you that you thought that was uh, that was great uh, great any any moments in the Grand Prix, Andrew. Well, I mean, there's the inter team battle at Toro Rosso that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Ma Max. Max Verstappen running his mouth. He's like, get, get all these motherfuckers out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a dirty mouth. <laughs> it's it's, uh, <laughs> A little bit of eighteen-year-old attitude. If you, but if you've watched uh, F one, like from from back when his dad used to race, Joseph Verstappen, he was like a bit mouthy and a bit of an angry dude back then. And honestly, to this point, I was like, oh, like wow, like Max Verstappen, he look he looks very ma very calm and collected in front of the media. He doesn't like speak out of t out of turn. I think <laughs> he did this time. We we saw we saw his jeans come out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's probably a bit more confident too to talk about him going to Mercedes and Ferrari this week. Okay, the, the kid has some talent for sure. That, that, that that's yeah. undeniable. But like, is it too early to tell? Is he a star of the future? Is he like he might be world championship material, but he won't get there until he gets there, and he won't get there without the right backing. And if he starts from now, like with that attitude, like I can see some teams like Ferrari not liking that. They're famously. Like they, they they really like to have a hold on the, their their team strategy and not they're not that great at having their teammates fight. Yeah, yeah. On the track. In that that's, that's true. But on the other hand, I, I mean, a lot of the great champions have looked pretty petulant in their youth. Um, and Max is really young compared to anyone. So young. Youngest driver in F one for sure. Yeah, he's 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 actually half the age of some of the other drivers on on the field. <laughs> Half. It's <laughs> crazy, but that's 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 the way the sport is these days, right? Yeah. It's that video game generation. Absolutely. Is in in terms of uh, and, and when we were talking before the interview, um, we said that you had taken a look at maybe some of the numbers and and and, and stuff that came out of the of the Australian Grand Prix. Um, is there anything that like really jumped out at you that 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 that, that you say this was really interesting, geez? Well, t undoubtedly, Toro Rosso dropped the ball through, through a combination of 
their strategists and drivers, uh, and their drivers wanting to kill each other. Um, I, I mean, I, I was looking at the timing data there. At the time, both of their drivers stopped. They were actually running much. Hang, hang on, Andrew. I think we lost you. I think they we lost just you. Build themselves so they can't go ahead of Palmer hang, and others. Hang, hang on a second. The, the, the connection is is not very good right now, Mike. Oh, are we are we back yeah, on? Yeah, we're good. Sorry, there, there was a bit of a of a choppiness going on. If I could take you back to the beginning of that sentence. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so definitely, Toro Rosso should have kept their cars out much longer. At the time they pitted around laps thirty one and thirty two, they're actually going much faster, about a second a lap faster than the cars behind them, but they hadn't yet built a pit buffer. If they kept Verstappen out until about lap 38, he would have managed to race 6th instead of 10th. Um, however, because Sainz came in, he thought he was getting undercut, and so he reacted aggressively. I don't know if the radio restrictions made it difficult for the team to convey that this was clearly not the optimal strategy, um, but that they really <laughs> dropped the ball stopping that early. It created it created lots of toppings. Or look, look, Jesus Christ, lots of to, lots of talking points <laughs> that that came out of that for sure. Like Verstappen radio, <laughs> Verstappen's radio. The fact that it was it was theirs to lose. Um, yeah. The the high point scoring position. They had everything that they needed. Then they they have they had a car that, as as you pointed out on 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 the blog, that was really punching above their height or or you know their weight. Um, they, they they had a good engine, a good reliable engine in the Ferrari of last Ferrari, year, where yeah. everything that had that could go wrong already went wrong last year with it. Uh, so you you would have thought that they had that sixth point, they had they they had that mm -hmm. sixth spot, they had that seventh seventh spot, but they threw it down. Um, Haas got it with the new engine. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> what what are your thoughts on Haas? Well, I, I think it's clear the result wasn't really of their performance but having said that they're doing a lot better than i had predicted um i, I think i i probably expected them to be somewhere around manor mm -hmm. I, I think yeah, yeah. i'd be pretty confident in saying they're ahead of manor and probably sauber too mm. yeah, i think so too sauber with the current ferrari engine as well and this is something that i don't understand but and, and i don't know if uh if andrew you've you've noticed the same thing uh, or are you you have an explanation for this, but it just seems to me that Ferrari they always like every year in the history of modern F1, they've had a series like a number of customer teams that use their engines, but they're never ever high up there. Even when Ferrari's winning races like the Michael Schumacher years, the the Ferrari customer teams were never up there. Mm. Yeah, it's like well, Ferrari are very careful in who they support. You know, they're very happy to support the minnows. They're not so happy to support teams that could directly challenge them, as Mercedes did in the class. Or, or, or modern-day Williams that have been... I guess they did okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They were third, really. I mean... Yeah, how much better are you going to do? Non-works team? <laughs> but you have... Yeah. But... Do you think that the gap is unsurmountable right now in between um mercedes and ferrari because that, that that is really what, what 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 this championship and what what f1 in 2016 is spending on really i mean there's going to be some interesting and very great battles in the midfield for sure like as a as a as an f1 fan that has already made my like yeah i've already made my opinion i already know that i like f1 i've been watching for long enough i know that i'm gonna enjoy the midfield but we have to consider the new fans, and in terms of the, the, a sport that right now is in, <laughs> let's be honest, is not the best situation. If we want to attract new fans, what needs to happen this year, what needs to happen in 2016, is a close battle at the top. Is right. like, do you think there's going to be that? Well, you always have to be difficult reading too much into Australia. Mm -hmm. But I did see some very positive signs, um, because if you look at Vettel's race, it was very badly compromised by the stoppage. Uh, he was on super soft tyres a few laps before the stoppage. Uh, he just burned through them to pull out about a five-second gap on Rosberg, and then the stoppage happened, and he didn't have new super softs to go on to. 
So what Ferrari opted to do, fearing that they wouldn't be able to match Mercedes on medium compounds, is they kept him on the super softs and then stopped him for softs later in the race. So what that meant was he began that stop without the gap he should have had and on one super softs to Rosberg's fresh mediums. Uh, he was still able to pull out a bit of a gap over the next five or so laps. Um, ultimately, you know, it cost him probably somewhere in the realm of about 10 seconds. And if you look at how quickly he caught Hamilton later in the race, he probably could have been nipping at the heels of Rosberg. Yeah. End of the race. Had the strategy gone to plan. Um, if they had some mediums, some fresh mediums left, maybe. <laughs> right. I mean, the other concern, however, is Rosberg allegedly had a break for the last 20 or so laps. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really see any indication of that from the lap times. So if, if Mercedes has a whole lot in reserve, that's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, it seems like they just kind of said that to like dispel. We won, but you know they, we didn't win too badly. <laughs> they said one of their brakes was broken. Yeah. It's it's and Hamilton pulled himself from sixth back up to the top as well. That was a true. But on, on the other hand, Vettel genuinely caught Hamilton in those closing laps. Um, you know, up to where Vettel made a mistake. So you would think if Hamilton had a lot of extra pace, he, he could have kept that gap. I realize it was mediums against softs, but it was encouraging for Ferrari. Half a second. Half a, half a second is all you need. Because half a second, um, if you're within half a second, you can play the DRS advantage at one point mm -hmm. or another. You can, you, can, yeah. you can try to do that. Some so, tracks two times a now, lap. Now, half a second in the absence of DRS would be terminal, would be like nobody. Nobody would be within the reach of anybody else. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. But, I th and, and, and this is one of the things that, I mean, I know I know DRS, when it got introduced, we were talking and we found it gimmicky. I found it gimmicky, but I had hopes for it. But, you know, whatever. That's Maybe that's that's me being, yeah, I I'm, I'm kind of opt optimistic of, of any change. I think they balanced it out, though. At first, some of the, the zones were too big, yeah. or the detection points were at this not the optimal point they've b they balanced it out big time for sure over the years andrew yeah. Yeah. what are the things that well I i'm interested and in, i'm sure many of the viewers and listeners are also interested is um y your background I in particular and we we, we actually really love to talk about it because um despite what ecclestone might have to say the fans are what what are keeping the sport alive and each fan has a different story. Each each person mm -hmm. finds or gets into F1 in a different way, and 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 does starts an F1 metrics blog uh, for their for their own reasons, as uh, so, podcast or a podcast. <laughs> so so I, I if if you're okay with that, I'd like to take a couple minutes and you know just uh, um, have you talk about like hey, your own personal experience with F1. How did how did you how did you stumble upon it like. Where where are you from? Is F1 a popular thing where you're from? Not particularly. I, I'm originally from Australia. Um, at, at the time I got interested in Formula 1, we did have a race in Adelaide. Um, I got exposed to Formula 1 through TV and computer games. Um, I went with my family to the Adelaide Grand Prix in 1993. That turned out to be Edmund Senna's last victory uh, and Alain Prost's last race. So it wow. was quite a good one to see. Oh, cool. Um, and from there, yeah, I just, my, the passion, sir. Um, I was sort of idolizing center at that time. Uh, everybody, so was. Every, everybody was. Everybody was. <laughs> um, but, but I carried on with it. Uh, it, it is particularly Australia because you need to get up at all sorts of hours to watch the races. But, <laughs> but it became sort of an obsession for me, and, and that's continued. It, being an F1 fan in a, okay, I'm, I'm assuming you, you, you lived, uh, in Australia until you moved to the States recently. Um, sure. uh, is it is it hard? Is it as hard to be a fan in Australia as it is in North America? In, 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 terms, in terms of how, un, how unpopular it is. It's, it's hard to come up with content. It's, hap like it's hard to stumble upon a bar that plays F1 races. I think there's a little more support for F1 in Australia. Mm. Um, that's probably through a combination of having some recent Mark Webber and Daniel Ricciardo and Rick. having an ongoing Danny race. Rick. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's picking up in the US, but it's still extremely uncommon for me to run an F1 fan here. And when I do, they're usually a foreigner. 
<laughs> what? You don't? You, you didn't watch the football? <laughs> you you weren't watching the okay, cause I, th I think didn't the uh, the 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 Super Bowl it coincided with something F one I forget. <laughs> I I really I I can't I I don't care about football at all. <laughs> <laughs> or not American football, I guess. Uh, but th 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 that's really interesting. And now you have um, the F1 metrics blog. We've talked, like mm -hmm. we already talked about it. We talked about it in the podcast before. Uh, yeah. Honestly, thanks, uh, yeah. thanks for taking the time. Honestly, this preseason form guide. I'm sure you, I'm sure you pissed off some of the teams <laughs> putting this together. Awesome. It's great. <laughs> it's great. I, I I understand math enough that. I understand what you did and I can read the data. It's it's great, but I don't understand how exactly or the the uh the equations that you chose to plot the slopes, etc. But listen, like it's it's easy to read. It's amazing. It, it, so we need your I, expertise. But but listen, this is this is this is this is what I was I was trying to to get at is that I look at this in the, in the exact same way, and like looking at a graph, like once it's once the data has been plotted and 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 everything has been sorted out and everything is being cleaned up, it becomes easy to understand. I mean, that's the whole point of, yeah. of these graphs and whatever. To, my my favorite is near the top. You have the uh, fuel corrected, averaged fourth stint fuel load, and you have the the degradation set on mm. the based on lap times. That's yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. So yeah, it, it, like, it's, this it's probably rivals what Pirelli has in their own books. Well, one hundred percent. But it oh, looked... I, I'm sure they have more than that. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, <clears throat> maybe more. But, points, but, I, but I, I mean, I hadn't seen anything like this in the public sphere, so I, I thought it was a good insight. Oh well, yeah, man. Oh, it's amazing. It's yeah, this is great, and and but the problem right now, and like we've we've been talking about this like kind of peripherally for a long time, and and we see the evidence now, like even mounting every day, that you. The the way that data is distributed and, and the information really is distributed in F1, you have uh, a, a very close circle up at the top where things very slowly trickle down to to some people that get the nod from from the powers that be like, oh, you <laughs> Autosport magazine, you motors, you, you, you know, you Sky F1, here's a chunk of data that you can have and you, you know, parse yeah. it any way you want, sell it to the public. But just from knowing... The little that I know about, I know that, like numbers, are some of the easiest things to skew one way or another and present one way or another to kind of try to like convince the public. Because if you have, a, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong, if you have a specific data set and you don't, you don't do what you ought to do with it, it's easy to make it say what you want it to say in certain circumstances. And I don't know, I don't know if you've. Uh, if Andrew, you've you've noticed that at all uh, within the th some things that are presented as facts out there in the F1 media and media. In general. I, I see that a lot. I I feel. I mean, a lot of the things we you know from the major broadcasters are almost the sort of factoids you'd find in like a sports almanac. I don't think they're necessarily very illuminating. You know, a lot of the time they'll present to us flying head-to-heads or race head-to-heads that don't take any of the context into account, you know, whether someone had a mechanical problem during qualifying or, or whatever. Um, and, and obviously a lot with the lap time analysis as well. You know, often very simple metrics are used, such as just the mean of a, of a stint, which is not very informative, frankly. Um, but often in these stints, you have these outlier laps where someone was slow due to traffic or a mistake and they abandoned a run and so forth. And if you include those, I mean, you skew the mean so much that it's almost pointless. But this is this is being presented and sold out there as 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 fact as this is what happened. This is where Mercedes is. This is where Ferrari is. And I, and I think that it's it's at least it's it's for you know up to us the fans to to realize that we we have to be careful with that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it you know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the predictability or unpredictability of the sport really like that that's that's what makes it interesting right like you you, you want a sport yeah. that where, you, where you're not gonna know where who the pole man or the uh first place man is gonna be uh two weeks before you know that you, you it's essentially it's like pirelli's job that's their direction well no it's, yeah they've been they've been basically given a mandate to to spice up the action as 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 have many yeah, or, or you know, organizations and bodies within so, F1. So can I can I ask you this? 
Um, yeah. So this this graph you have of the you sort of averaged the medium tires on a lap time offset at Barcelona and mm -hmm. plotted along the degradation rate of seconds a lap. Is this what we should be doing? Because in, in the last week, I've looked at a couple races from the 50s. I've just watched sort of some race highlights from the 50s. Those guys put on the tires. There's one kind of tires. You just, you just put the tires on and go. Do we really need five kinds of tires? Or really seven, if you include the rain, the intermediates and the wets. Do we need seven types of tires? Or do, we, should, do you think we should have maybe a soft and a hard and then you just you go with that do we do we well, need this complicated degradation per lap and depending how hard you push you get a do a chart like each team is building their own charts like this based on right. their own car aerodynamics weight and camber and all, all this combined I, I think the issue is yeah, it's hard to turn back the clock like yeah. i mean if you go back to a classic <laughs> race it's like no burgering 57 you know, Fangio won the race on, on a two-stop strategy. Uh, he lost a bunch of time. A uh, one-stop strategy, sorry. He, he lost a bunch of time in the pits, and then he had ninety seconds come back drive. Yeah, they but would that, get out of the time, car and change the spark yeah. plugs and have a scratch. <laughs> but I mean, change at that the time, the teams shirt. were largely guessing. Whereas today, you know, they collect their data from practice, yeah. and you know, I'm sure they're able to produce much more sophisticated predictions than I am, just from you know taking people's stints off. Uh, and as a result, you know, they can very accurately predict what will be the optimal strategy for a race. Right. And so if you're going to create unpredictability, you have to th throw some variables at the teams. So for ex example, in Australia, most of the teams didn't get to run practice sessions due to the wet weather. So they had very little in the way of dry data. And as a result, we saw a great race. And we've seen that many weekends, you know, in recent years, when you have a rained out practice session, often you have a really interesting race. So I, I think, you know, in, in some way you need to bamboozle the teams <laughs> if one is an unpredictable race. And one way of doing that is throw a whole bunch of tire compounds at them. Another would be severely limit the practice. Uh, another would be, you know, you know, get Pirelli to do something somewhat unpredictable. Whether that's good for the sport or, or good from a sporting side, I, I don't know. You could argue that, you know, throwing random chance factors in is not fair. Um, and that's really a subjective call, but I, I think that's the motivation for it. You know, we can't necessarily look back to what happened and worked in the sixties or seventies back when teams were maybe five or 10 people and there was no telemetry. Um, because if you, yeah. if you would have faced the teams today with the same challenges, Two they'd all come matches. up with the optimal strategy, you know, and it would be quite a boring race. But... Oh, and, and, and for sure. I mean, yeah, it, the depriving teams from the data that they need to make their own, whatever adjustments, by by limiting qualifying is something that perhaps is some it, it, f1 is not going to touch for the it, it, anywhere in the near time because getting rid of getting rid of friday let's say like let's say we get rid of uh of p1 and p2 yeah i can't do that come on you can't yeah but this it, is it'll be completely worth it like like to me even even to me it would like i'd have to sit down and think do i want to go to montreal this year because if if there's if nothing's gonna happen till Saturday, it's gonna make a difference. It's gonna make a difference in everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and arguably, I mean, track time is already so limited. Testing, you, you could argue, we've already gone too far in that direction. But yeah, there's a debate to be had there. Now, is F1 taking all those debates right now way too far? in a level where they shouldn't be going like we're like we're, we're living surprisingly so i'm honestly i mean okay remember when we started watching the races together this was back in 2011 11, 20, yeah. 2010 2011 11, right 10, 11, but even 10. even even before that if you go back well 2010 2011 would have been five years ago so five years ago you tell somebody that's an f1 fan or 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 you know a sponsor or a, a track promoter or anybody and and, and you told them in five years from now, we're gonna, <laughs> we're not. The season's gonna start, and we're not gonna know what the qualifying format's gonna be. They laugh. They laugh in my face. They're like, "What are you watching? Why? Like, why are you watching this silly? Split? What?" <laughs> yeah, that's true. But so, so what's where? Where well, are things we, going on? Really, right now? we had the same conversation two weeks ago. Right. The season's about to start, and we don't know what the qualifying se session is gonna be like. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's, we had that it's, same it's, talk two weeks ago, and we 
We don't know what it's going to be like in three weeks from now after Bahrain. In this China, nobody knows what China qualifying is going to be like but yet. Are people losing <laughs> sight of what the real problem is? Is my question. Like, are, are, are the people in power right now in F1, are they so out of touch with what the fans actually want need or you know whatever like what what would makes the ha- what would make the ha- the fans happy are they so out of touch with that i that think they- undoubtedly yes uh, given some yeah. of the comments that come from them agreed i mean there was genuine surprise when fans were, were outraged by double points <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was that was dumb yeah that made and again it's like one of those things that they did that made absolutely no difference at all if it, they had well, if, whether they had no whether they had been double points or not the championship would have ended the same way, but it could have been different. But yeah, as, as, even it if it was different and the double points did change it, that champion would have been shunned for history. Twenty years from now, people would have said, "Oh yeah, that guy won the championship that year, but that was the one year they tried this <laughs> double points thing." So probably the real champion was blah blah blah. Who would have been the kind next guy down? Kind of how 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 people. Well, that that actually happened in IndyCar last year, so we'll see if that really. <laughs> For real? Oh, okay. yeah. uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not. I'm not very familiar with IndyCar. They what, tried what? double points too. Yeah, they, they use double points essentially. Montoya <laughs> lost the championship as a result. Mon- Montoya! Oh my god! He's a country <laughs> boy. I'm I'm from Colombia. He's Colombian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, actually, Montoya. Like now that we're talking about Montoya, uh, Montoya was sort of the reason why I got into F1. I mean, it, really, Senna was, but Montoya solidified. He's well. He's right. a world champion too. Yeah. Well, well, oh no no, world no, 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 no! Sorry, sorry. World he star. Could, he could, he could have he, been a world champion. Sorry, but world star. He did IndyCar, NASCAR, <laughs> and well, Formula One. Yeah. Montoya. If he hadn't been so angry or such an asshole. <laughs> it's kind of like the Villeneuve's. Yeah. Well, no. Our, our countryman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jacques at least. He's a bit, yeah, ja- Jacques. He's a bit of a run, dick. Running his mouth everywhere <laughs> he went. Uh, I got a question. I'm not sure if you guys talked about this yet, but uh, does any of your data show? Like, I'm not sure how long you've been sort of following F1 in this sort of degree, but like, uh, in terms of qualifying, is there anything that sh- to show? I, I know, like, very vari- like a variable might not be excitement. Uh, but is there anything that to show uh, if different forms of um, of qualifying could could lead to more unique uh, grid positions? Uh, grid positions. Thank you. That's a great question. I've never looked at that. I mean, m- my guess would be the one lap format tend to sort of jumble the grid somewhat. Um, and there, there are actually metrics for calculating how much a list has become jumbled. Um, so this, yeah, that's something that would be interesting. Interesting, yeah, because I mean, uh, like, so I, I, I just recently started getting into F1, the, thanks thanks to these guys, <laughs> and um, it is a very unique sport in its sort of uh, approach to how it manages uh, all the teams, because it's not like uh, hockey like it is in Canada here, or like the f- or football, or, or any other sort of other sport, mm-hmm. uh, but racing is very unique because it, it requires money, it requires lots of money, lots of money, sponsorship, uh, how much time you get on television. Uh, so to sort of uh, to, to, to uh, elevate it is uh, to, to bring it to the next level in terms of um, uh, to make it exciting, m- not even exciting, but more accessible okay. th- to, to people uh, is something I'm always really curious about. Uh, it's not so much a question is like how do how do you have an approach maybe that uh, that you've thought about uh, in terms of how to alleviate that? Like how do, how, how do you bring more people with just the the sport itself and not in terms of like advertisement or or anything gimmicks like that or, or, or gimmicks exactly? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think really the sports leaders have been taking the wrong recently in trying to change the product itself rather than how it actually reaches the fans. Mm. Um, so, for instance, the move away from free-to-air TV, I, I think, is a really a terrible decision. It's so yeah. short-sighted. Um, I, I mean, I, I certainly did, and I'm sure many other fans only found the sport because it was on free-to-air TV. Yeah. <laughs> or, why would someone sign you know, a Sky TV subscription to watch F1 when they know nothing about it? It, it just wouldn't happen. Um, you know, we've gone from 600 million viewers in eight down to an estimate around 370 million last year by the same metric. Oh, wow. Uh, so, you know, it's a pretty serious drop. Yeah. 
You've seen some se- <clears throat> a couple major articles in the last few weeks, at least, though, looking at the illegal streaming of the pay services, you know, that offer, you know, the the premium content, but for free right. because there's no reason. To- We've talked about me and Jay yeah. have talked about this a lot of times. If Sky was available in Canada. We for, would be paying for it for a reasonable price. Yeah, for a reasonable. You don't need to pay six hundred bucks a year or whatever. But if if a distributor, something like Netflix, hope fingers crossed, right. could get into sports distribution and you know attract a content like that, would be great. But there's there's really no way in North America to really watch it. It's it. it but it's it's because right now the the way that these companies so you you're you're a big multi million or billion dollar company that has the budget to spend to like just throw away on something like F one, you approach these things in, in in terms of of uh, of exposure. How much exposure is your gonna is your brand gonna get if you side with this team or that or whatever or this driver or that or whatever? Um, you put you put it out there. You make your calculations. You throw some numbers around. And you say, oh, you know what? We're gonna get this many minutes of airtime throughout the season. This is what this is how much that's worth. That's how much it's gonna cost us. And is it gonna bring so many returns? Now, calculating that right now, with the numbers that they have available, I would think. I don't know, Andrew, if you agree with me. It's com completely retarded and makes no sense because they're not taking into consideration the vast amount of people that are watching illegally online can, can we ask how you are obviously you're not watching 10 sports anymore how, how do you how do you find I, I the watch races to watch? I I, occasionally I, I will go out with people to, to try to watch it somewhere public um I, I do occasionally try nbc but i find the ads off-putting the ads oh my god yeah, <laughs> NBC. Bet NBC is too F1. much. Bet sports F one, just yeah. nonstop gambling. No, and... no, N- NBC, NBC, the American one. Oh yeah, uh, it's, it's yeah, this. Yeah. My, my first choice is always wherever Brundle is commentating. <laughs> <laughs> he's the best, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's great. <laughs> he has because like, he he has no problem just speaking his mind in the moment. Yeah, well, he speaks yeah. his mind and he knows his stuff. Uh, yeah, not many. Other. Well, he he was a driver. Yeah, he's great. He's got nothing to lose. He was a driver. <laughs> he, he knows everybody. He's probably driven more F1 well. cars than anybody else. Yeah. He's driven like 40 F1 cars. Oh, wait, he's yeah. gotten to drive every era. He knows everybody. He's friendly. <laughs> he's a friendly guy. He speaks his mind. He's great. He's, he's the best. But, okay, reconciling F1 with, you know, the world as it exists right now has proven to be a difficult task. Because the people at the top, the the you know, the head of the FIA, the head of FOM, can seem to to really like un- grasp the world. They they they're still approaching every case. Jean Todd, the guy that runs the FIA, the president of the FIA, he was very successful in his days. Uh, actually, he had he had two rounds of like ultimate great success. The first one very early in his career. When um, he brought Peugeot to yep. the, the the top of the podium time and time again, I think many years in a row in World Rally, and then he moved to F1 and worked his way up to become the team principal of Ferrari during the Schumacher years, where he enjoyed another like half a decade of unlimited success. Pretty much at anywhere that they went, they knew that they were going to win the championship. The fact that their past formula and and Ecclestone, like we all know that, <laughs> a buddy of mine, like uh, a, a, a few years ago when when Vettel was winning every race um, with the Red Bulls, he like we were having a discussion about F one, and he said like, oh, I don't watch F one because, uh, uh, you know, who who wins who wins every year in F one right now, and I, and my my answer was Ecclestone. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 who, that's the only person that wins in F one every single year these days. <laughs> and, um, but but because they think that their tried and true formulas that worked back in those days are gonna work forever, that might be holding the sport back. And, and we're we're seeing a huge backlash right now. Major like, sim racing. Oh yeah, you, you wanted blows to say, my mind. Yeah, yeah. Blows my mind. Their their attack on. Their, the mods for that for the 
I think it's the official Formula One game, right? Yeah. I, I haven't read the article. I think I read it last but week. Even if it was like our factor, whatever, whatever it is, whatever their approach to new media right now, the official F1 yeah. approach to yeah. new media is completely backwards. This, um, this Andrew, do, do you play any video games or uh, you know F, F, I, I do. I, I play a lot of Bar Factor, um, which at this point hasn't been affected. I mean, constantly shooting themselves in the foot. It's ridiculous. I'm assuming this latest wave has probably been prompted by Codemasters trying to protect their product. Although I'm not yeah, entirely... a shit product. <laughs> it's, gar- it's it's kind of garbage, right? At the at the same yeah. time, the past week. The FOM has shut down, I think, the top six Twitter accounts, um, motoring history, and one, but just a, there's five or six of them, almost like a third of a million subscribers that saw F1 content daily that these people had built up. They just, the accounts, accounts just deleted like that. They just disappeared with no explanation because F1 has power and can but tell he, Twitter. But here's a problem. Here's a problem with that, that I have like, you know what? If you want to, if you want to take uh, down a rent-seeking, um, massive publication that's just looking for clickbait and to make a quick buck out of F1, and if they're publishing stories that are not necessarily true or not necessarily like helpful to the fans, then maybe as the sole controller of the commercial rights, you have a duty. To prevent the spread of that, maybe you know what you, you know. What I mean? If you want to rationalize it like that, as long but as what it's they're not what they you know who they're going after? They're going after the fans. They're going after the, the fans, like That's the the hardcore is. fans. Andrew, because your web your website right now, uh, if you go if you go mm-hmm. to the to to to, to, to the first uh, to to the homepage, F1 metrics, it it n- not a single time uh, after it says F1, uh, there's a TM beside it. Mm-hmm. Because that doesn't happen, they like FOM. If they wanted to, they could come and shut you down. Theoretically, but, yeah, they well, you know, well, shut down. They, they, yeah. well, you know, they'll just have like they'll pay a lawyer to send you a letter, and then what are you gonna do? Like, <laughs> I don't have, I don't have the money. Nobody has the money to fight FOM. No, none of the fans, at least, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> so why, like, I remember growing up with this one saying that exists in like pretty much every language that I know. And it said you don't you don't bite the hand that feeds. So <laughs> so why is F one right now has turned in their very very weird way? Why is why is F O M and the people that own F one yeah. are turning to the fans to alienate the fans? Shutting down Twitter accounts, shutting down. There's been a couple Reddit accounts that have been posting content, uh, all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> Something like yours, podcasts. Yeah. Yeah, everything. Is 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 this the, logical, and the, Andrew? At the same time, the official F1 YouTube channel, you compare it to any other major sport, the NFL, the NHL, Major League Baseball, soccer, fighting, fighting, all of them, all of them. There's, there's, yeah, there's they're not nothing, doing enough. There's nothing there. They're not yeah, doing they're, anything. There's still years behind this. I mean, they are picking up, but they're for now, the same type of form is taking content down so rather than putting it up. Right. What uh, one thing that, that that I like to ask uh, our guests when 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 we have our guest is what what would you do? What what is one thing that you would do if you were Echo Stone <laughs> that would that that you think that you that, that would move the sport in the right direction? Yeah, right now before Bahrain, before next race. Well, we, aside, and let's say aside from qualifying because it's decisions. too obvious. <laughs> Our decisions the week before a race would be a good start. Um, but how about a streaming service? I mean, I realize there's some somewhat by some of the TV contracts they already have in place. But I think that would be a great place to start. I mean, the number of people who would sign up for probably one to two hundred dollars a year, if you offered them, you know, a stream of each, maybe some access to historical content ability to review races i mean it would be phenomenal it's a huge unexploited market i've said it a million times i'd pay somewhere 10 to 20 dollars 10 to 20 bucks a race something like that to watch i mean the full weekend's content maybe and most movies i see these days are hey well why would i not watch for an f1 race yeah why why, yeah why wouldn't you stream an, an f1 race yeah why not that's what i keep saying if you could get the weekend's content practice qualifying in the race maybe a little bit of content that's what everybody wants content, 10 to 20 bucks 
for Sky, like that's something close to or, two hundred dollars or something year. similar. Let's 20. let's just call it let's just call it a good quality F one broadcast. No commercials, mm-hmm. just a good quality F one uh, F one broadcast. People would pay money. I pay money. I I, I, I you I pay money. I hadn't realized, and I, I found out this week the NFL, the football league, pay has a service you can buy per game or a season season pass type of thing. You can stream and watch all the races online. This I mean, exists in motorsports. The, the Moto GP has done it. Uh, the World Rally Championship has done it. Formula One still no word. Yeah, and is, more... Isn't Formula E like miles ahead now with three uh, uh, like virtual reality yeah. broadcasting? Yeah, Formula, Formula E is doing well. Uh, Indy as well. I mean, put basically all their races on YouTube. Yeah. That's Indy does. That's For, Formula E just announced this week. They put out that 360. Uh, the first sports mm. highlight video on 360 a couple of weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. We talked about That's that. insane. And they just announced this week, two or three days ago, they've been actually recording every race this year in 360. And for next oh, year, wow. every race is going to be streamable in 360 for the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive. Oh, that's brilliant. That you can just you can watch in 360. That's but that's okay. So it's these, incredible. These are sports. The thing that, is, these, these aren't new ideas either. I mean, I remember ten years or, or longer ago, people were saying, "Why don't we have these cool technologies in F one where you can choose who's on board you want to watch, etc." Yes. Uh, it just never happened. Yeah, it's been, well, po- could, it's been I, possible. Like at that point, like you, you wouldn't be able to like the average consumer like nor had the internet power or the computer power. Maybe not in 1080 oh, like oh, yeah. now, well, but it was Back possible. then, but right now it is. Now it is. Yeah. Uh, there's, F1, no, there's no excuse now. F1's only been in HD for two or three years now. It's just, it's oh. just, uh, it's just been started. Yeah. Yeah. It's, we're stuck with, with, with management that doesn't, that we talked about this, Andrew, and I, I don't know if you'd agree, but uh, last week, actually, like when, when you weren't here either, Danny, um, yeah. but, we talked about how right now the sport is in a bit of a pickle because the organizations at the very top level that are supposed to be doing a job aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. FOM as as commercial rights holder, they they like honestly, like if it was up to me, I'd put a clause in their contract. No politicking. None of this like bullshit politics. Your job is to present if is to take the F one feeds the feed, and like edit them and yeah, distribute it. Put them at, awesome. to, to as many people as possible with the, you know in the best way possible. FIA, yeah. you should be regulating in the best way possible and to the most effective possible. You know, the, you know, whatever safety safety is never going to be not a concern. I mean, it, it, like, back in the day it wasn't, but that's why you, you know whatever safer. safety can be one of the mandates of the of the FIA, but if they if they just took the time to regulate the way they should be regulating instead of being if, instead of getting time to go all through all the details but anyone listening or if you haven't seen it the GPDA's open letter that was put out on the 23rd and really Bernie Ecclestone's response to that he's in his response seems like uh it's against his mandate and in agreement let me let me read you the last sentence of Bernie Ecclestone's response to the GPDA. He said, I've been in Formula One nearly 50 years in an active role and another 18 involved in some way. And he said, uh, uh, re- re- referring to the GPDA letter, you state every individual acts with the very best intentions. I'm not sure if this is a misprint. If not, it should read with their very best intentions. So... This, is, this has been a big topic this week, especially since the qualifying thing yeah. and the qualifying revamp didn't get passed. Yeah. Everyone's got their own intentions involved and maybe the democratic way that they thought was so great isn't the best or especially now is not it's not the best way forward. <laughs> the <laughs> it's a lot of arguing about ego and money that gets mm. in the way of the racing, right? This week and well, and this year marks another anniversary. Uh, you know, whatever. Like, so Bernie's been in the sport for fifty years. Fifty years uh, this year. Ten out of those fifty years, um, Bernie has been in the sport in a commanding role because of a decision that happened ten years ago of bringing CVC Capital into the sport as the owner. So ten years. He- so it's it's been ten years, and I and I assure you 
Nobody is cutting a CVC shaped cake right now to celebrate <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> yeah. Be- and, and, and it's just this string of bad decision after bad decision after bad decision that doesn't seem to be ending that has driven us to here. I want to put a thing forth right now to anybody that's listening, to anybody that's watching. The only way that these people are going to understand is going to be via a radical event like Ecclestone dying. But honestly, I mean, how long have we been waiting for that to happen? He's obviously not going <laughs> to retire. Like, yeah, he's, he's obviously not going to retire. Like, <laughs> things are going to keep going like you know, from bad to worse unless we, as the fans, do something about it. And honestly, like it can be just as simple as the boycott that the Reddit guys wanna wanna start. Uh, as I, don't know. I, I still want to see the races. Yeah, no, you don't have to not see the races. But there's <laughs> al- there's alternatives out there these days. And I'm not. I mean, just, I think I, I know you're going with this. Yeah. But I think it's we have to not support their platform, right? In in whatever shape, because we do it anyways to whatever degree that is yeah right how many people on reddit or on youtube just like post a video it does get taken down eventually but like we want to see highlights we want to see all these things we want yeah. to watch it live yeah 100 we have to do that on well, our own that's that, 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 that that's what i'm saying and and i think that uh more than it has ever been before right now more than it's ever been we've had the chance right now as fans the uh, the alternative f1 media like I think we can count ourselves in, um, Andrew. You can count yourself in. Like it is, it is more important now than it have, it has ever been to continue with this stuff. Let's keep putting our content out there. Let's keep like putting our voices out there, our opinion. And I think that eventually, Jesus, when when they have no other option other than to accept that the world has moved on, they will they will eventually mm. make the changes that need to be made. But it's it's annoying when every other sport. Every other sport has moved, moved on. Espe- this year, this year has been a huge leap. Every sport, YouTube, because it's never been, it's, ev- it's never been reality. easier. There's so many options out there. Yeah. So true. I have a tipping point will, win, will be when they start to lose money, because um, for now that hasn't happened. They've lost a lot of fans, um, but they've done that cleverly in a way because they've they've it's free to air for pay TV, so they're milking a lot more money from the fans that remain. But, you know, over time, they're not going to be bringing in new fans. They're going to lose the existing fan base. Um, and at some point, you know, that means they're not going to be profitable. Of course, CBC doesn't care about that because they'll sell out before they're getting out. Yeah. Um, the, the but price at that was point, announced the sports leaders afternoon. will have to ask what the hell are we doing. Yeah, the price was announced this afternoon by, by Bernie Ecclestone about 8.5. Two, two people have agreed on the price of about $8.5 million. Billion. So, sorry, billion dollars, about billion. six billion, six billion pounds, for the thirty-five percent that that CVC holds. So which, who is which, the buyer? Which they haven't, they haven't disclosed. Those haven't that. been disclosed. Okay. Bernie yeah. himself. It, Bernie it himself holds five. <laughs> yeah. 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 Bernie himself holds five percent. So at that valuation is, you know, about eighteen, nineteen billion. His 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 share is about almost a billion dollars. <laughs> Bernie's not gonna sell out until he's like on it, like on his deathbed, yeah, like, with no possibility of ever recovering. <laughs> he'll leave that. That's his legacy. His five percent. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I don't think he'll sell. If I recall, he also has some ownership by his wife, right? Bambino. Bambino Corporation. Yeah. yeah. It's. I mean, it's <laughs> the ownership structure of and, F1 uh, is. Really it? confused. Delta, Delta yeah. Topco. Delta Topco. Alpha Topco. Beta Alpha Topco. Topco but yeah. <laughs> All the the four levels of top code. Have you have you gotten into that? Have you taken like a a journey into the complicated ownership structure of F one? A, a little. I mean, I, I read a lot of Joe Sauer's stuff, and he covers that quite a bit. Yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it goes it goes deep. It steps up many levels. It, it is a real mess. <laughs> Even Eccleson in the uh, at the end of the day, he likes to like him. His attractiveness, like what what a lot of people like, why a lot of people keep giving him credibility is because he keeps saying to everybody, "Listen, I'm I have the sports best interest at heart. Like <laughs> with all these decisions, like I just want I just want the best for F1 or whatever." He's starting that, to look for it. Yeah, it, people buy into it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it, that argument is not holding anymore. <laughs> no. He's he's a strong old man. He's I don't believe half of what he says. 
<laughs> he is a brilliant manipulator, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Andrew, can we? I mean, I guess it's it's we're we're nearing into into the hour now. Uh, can we say that we'll have another one of these later in the year? I would certainly be up for that. This Perhaps a lot of fun. once you've compiled some more data. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. cool. I, I'm always doing these analyses. I, I mean, the only reason I started the blog is I was going to do them anyway and figured I might as well share them. <laughs> and we I honestly thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I'm, I'm glad I found this. It's, especially the uh, the preseason form guide. Anyone that hasn't seen it yet, check it out. F1metrics.wordpress.com. Yeah. Thank you. I can see. Uh, yeah. For, yeah, for real. This is some serious. I'm sure you annoyed some teams with this <laughs> <laughs> especially on the tire data it's it's amazing um it, and it's crazy it fits that curve it's it is it's, it's great <laughs> <laughs> andrew thank you very much for coming by uh we'll keep talking though yeah. and uh hey if you like if you feel like you need something like you need you need, you need to like send us something or or go on or come on the show at any time let us know if not uh we'll keep our listeners and watch and and viewers up to date of uh when the next one is gonna be fantastic i'll be watching uh, uh, thanks very much one one closing one when are you thinking of going to the canadian grand prix <laughs> <laughs> i i tried to convince my wife this year but i think it will have to be in how, how about so maybe next year what what if what, would some free tickets sway your thinking <laughs> <laughs> no, we. It would be difficult to say no. <laughs> we're no, we actually uh, just a segue to like we 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 have this contest going on uh, for our viewers and watchers uh, and listeners uh, of of win win a pair of F one tickets. Uh but but anyway, yes. If you do uh, ever like think of coming to the Canadian Grand Prix, definitely uh, keep in touch. We go every year. Fantastic. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And enjoy the Bahrainian Grand Prix. Grand Prix. Go all right we'll we'll do it. enjoy qualifying cheers <laughs> <laughs> i will try we will try very hard have a good one man uh, cheers bye. ciao talk to you later what a good guy Shit, I took my yeah, headphones. Yeah, we're, yeah we're still on we're still live <laughs> <laughs> that was very cool yeah for, for real, f1 metrics f number one metrics that wordpress.com you can see all, all those blog entries <laughs>